from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Eric Gansworth, our presenter today, is a, pre, is a professor of English at Canisius College and is a member of the Onondaga Nation. He is a prolific writer and he treats such themes as cultural identity and marginalization in his work. In his 2005 novel, Mending Skins, he details the lives of members of New York's Tuscarora tribe. In 2007, his anthology of Native American writing, Sovereign Bones, New Native American Writing, Volume 2, he stresses the problems that Native Americans have in preserving their culture and values. In 2008, a poetic collection, A Half-Life of Cardiopulmonary Function, Poems and Paintings, Eric addresses the marginalization of Native Americans. And in his latest young adult novel, If I Ever Get Out of Here, he tells the story of a Native American teenager confronting the larger society. Eric's writings make us aware of worlds that many of us may never know, and hopefully leaves us with new thoughts and insights now, many of you may not be aware of the fact that the people who are presenters bid on their authors that they will present. And uh, sometimes it, it gets a little ugly up there on Capitol Hill, as you know, and that happens in the Library of Congress. And I have to say that I elbowed out a number of my colleagues who also wanted the honor of presenting Eric uh, this afternoon. And I'm happy to say I won. And I would like to tell you the reason why I felt so passionately about being his presenter. And that is because I know his books get categorized to teens and young adults. I think that the themes he addresses and the way he presents problems cover all age groups and they have relevance to everyone. And I don't think you can say that about every author. So before I turn the podium over, I would just like to remind you that the program is being videotaped for subsequent broadcasting on the library's website so that those people who can't be with us this afternoon can still hear and learn from our many, many authors. You are encouraged to offer your comments and ask your, and ask your questions following the formal presentation during the question and answer period, but please know that you may be recorded, either your voice or your image may appear. And so we consider that by participating in the question and answer period, you are consenting to the library's possible reproduction and transmission of your remarks. And so with that, please welcome Eric Gensworth to the podium. Afternoon. Uh, thank you so much to the Library of Congress for inviting me to participate in this, to, uh, to offer my work to you. Thank you to you, the audience, who's shown up here. Um, I understand the author who's coming after me um, is not able to make it today. So those of you who are kind of squatting, waiting for good seats, um, I'm not really a zombie writer, but I will try to be as zombie-like as possible at certain times. Um, <clears throat> Thank you also to the volunteers who work on the National Book Festival. Uh, I've served as a volunteer for a number of different organizations, and it's a tremendous amount of work at, uh, at much, much smaller venues. So please, if you would, um, give a hand to the volunteers. All right. Um, it's kind of a strange thing. I, I work as a, as a college professor, and um, I talk to groups of people all the time, and, and I go around the country as well and talk to you know, somewhat larger groups. But this is fairly overwhelming, so let me just kind of take a moment and, and see you all. And 
and see that some people are disappointed and thinking, can I bolt and he won't notice because he's not the zombie writer? Uh, you can, that's, that's your prerogative. Um, initially, I had, uh, had made prepared comments uh, for this, and uh, it occurred to me that I just simply could not memorize them to any kind of great length. So instead, I thought, um, I tend to be much better at the, uh, the Q&A part of the program. And um, I know people get terrified early on in the program of asking the questions. Nobody wants to come up and ask that first question. So uh, I thought I'd do a Jeopardy thing. So I wrote some questions up. <clears throat> the first question. Could you tell us a little about the book? All right, so this book, uh, I want to clarify, its title is definitely If I Ever Get Out of Here. It's set in the mid-1970s. Um, and it's about a reservation kid who is, um, whose experience has been entirely on a reservation school from kindergarten through, um, through fifth grade. And this, to some degree, reflects my experience. I am from a very, very small reservation in New York State. It's home to uh, about 900 people. As such, everybody knows everybody's business. Um, and when you're a little kid, that's kind of a drag because you cannot get away with anything. All right, it's just, just a matter of fact. Um, and the, the odd thing is, though, because we spend all this time with one another, we are really, really not prepared um, at the end of fifth grade to get shipped out into the very large middle school. And so we went from knowing 24 people to uh, being thrown into a class of about 370, uh, which, is, which is fairly terrifying. Um, this main character, Lewis, uh, is tracked into, I don't think they do this anymore, uh, but when I was in middle school, they, they did this thing called, called tracking, which was that whatever your performance had been through elementary school, um, it kind of dictates where it is you're going to be placed in middle school. And you're then kind of stuck with that group of people for um, at least one year, and then they sort of see how you're, how you're progressing. So I was tracked in the, in the upper academic, um, category, because I was a reader, I was really, really interested in reading, kind of that nerdy kid. Um, and I was excited to be there, but I discovered on the very first day that I was the only kid I knew in that section. And um, that was fairly alarming at first, but I thought, well, you know, I could maybe know how to make friends, though I'd never really had to do it in seven years, so I was kind of rusty. Um, it didn't really happen that way either. I didn't discover until years later uh, when one of my uh, classmates who became, I became friends with as adults finally said, you know, the reason nobody really talked to you that first year was because um, when we were bad, our parents would threaten us and say, you know, if you don't behave, we're gonna drop you off with the wild Indians. So I was uh, the, the wild Indian incarnate, evidently. Um, and so I got to really thinking about that and what a, what a weird period of these three years uh, were. And the friends I did eventually have uh, in this group were the kids who were, um, were from military families. There was an Air Force base nearby. And so those kids also came to our middle school. And I thought, wow, they're like way friendlier than everybody else. So of course, because they weren't from Western New York, they hadn't had the wild Indian threat card played on them at that point. Um, and so those were very satisfying uh, relationships in some ways. And um, I really wanted to explore how those things came about and, and sort of what that life was like. And uh, thanks to Google, I was able to track down one of my old friends from, from middle school. And uh, surprisingly, he didn't live that far away, maybe three hours, and uh, I emailed him and, and we talked some. And uh, one of the things I asked him was, uh, so what was going on with you? Why were you so open? And, and he said, well, we live in military families, so we didn't have much time to make friendships. So we learned to make them really, really fast. Um, and we didn't really care about context in part because also we knew we might not stick around that long. And so I've thought about this uh, a lot over the years, but I also realized that uh, I'd been kind of avoiding it. 
Um, so to clarify, the title again, uh, though it is If I Ever Get Out of Here, it is not about rejecting reservation life because um, I, didn't, I didn't go to this school um, willfully. <laughs> we were just sort of forced to go there. And I also kind of thought that since it's about middle school, I thought that title would be pretty self-explanatory. Um, you know, <clears throat> who loves middle school? Uh, it seemed to me everybody I knew always wanted to get out of there. Um, and so one of the other things I, I examined was that in my work uh, for adults, I often look at the past pieces to see what it is I haven't yet mind or dealt with or you know tried to engage with and I realized that all of my characters seem to have um, a three-year period where their lives are not addressed whatsoever so I mean and I had you know I'd written um, several novels by that point and each one of them the protagonists don't exist like from the age of 11 to 14 suddenly they're they're kids and kids and kids for a while and then suddenly they're in high school and your stock in trade as a writer, in part, is to, is to introduce terrible things to your protagonists. You know, uh, happy no like, nobody reads happy novels. And I was looking for a conflict in some way. And, uh, and I realized that I had been engaging in avoidance behavior in the 20 years I'd been publishing. Like, I just refused to acknowledge middle school at all. And I thought, well, it's time to finally do that. Um, and so that's, that's where this novel is set. And it is about, in fact, um, a reservation kid entering middle school and, and meeting a kid from um, a military family and, and the friendship that develops with them. Uh, there are a lot of complicating factors for the two of them in that um, because the military kid, George, is really um, wanting to kind of move fast in this friendship, He's, you know, he's making overtures and inviting Lewis, the protagonist, to his house, um, and you know, trying to like in, engage in various other appropriate middle school social activities, like going to the mall or going to the arcade, and and Lewis can't really return this favor, and he knows it ahead of time. Um, Lewis's house is very much like the house I grew up in, and to clarify, that means that um, there was no running water. We used an outhouse. Um, we had one of those ancient uh, cast iron pumps out back, and that's how we got water every day and brought it into the house and, and heated it up for you know, any time we needed water. Um, we also, because of a fluke, in, I, I think a, an early fire in the house had happened, and we didn't really have electrical outlets except for one. Um, and so the rest of our house was wired by extension cord. Uh, just these massive, uh, octopi of extension cords coming out of this one poor little box down at the bottom of the of the dining room, and so uh, and I've I've kind of avoided writing about this house a lot for you know for various obvious reasons, but it seemed that it was really time to finally do it and and meet that, and so that's Lewis's house, and he understands that no matter what happens in this friendship, he is not going to be able to reciprocate. Um, I'd like to read a little passage of it for you. And this is um, right after the first time Lewis has gone to George's house. So he has seen um, this, this kind of small, very neat military home um, that's really on the sparse side as well because the military families tend not to accumulate a lot because they have to move this stuff all the time. And um, in our house, on the other hand, was... Uh, uh, you know, it could have probably been on that Hoarders TV show that's on right now, so. Um, so that's sort of where we are. Lewis has just visited, and George's father has brought him home. Uh, it's nighttime, so it's dark, it's the middle of winter. And what George's father sees is that the house is dark. And he's worried that, that he's dropping this kid off into a house where, where nobody's home. But Lewis knows that's not the case. So this is Lewis saying, no, no, it's fine. I know there's somebody home. He, get, he extracts himself from that situation. So this is Lewis entering the house. When I walked in, my ma was washing dishes on the, dinner, the, on the dining room table, pouring water from a kettle into the rinse pan. Usually, she did this with the overhead lights on, filling the room with light, one of her few luxuries. 
We weren't supposed to turn that light on unless it was absolutely necessary. Was wondering if you were ever going to get home, she said. What's all that stuff? I was carrying my school bag, an album that the, that the Haddonfields had let me borrow, and leftovers from our pizza supper. She stepped from the dishpans to the water pail and began filling it again. I knew she would kill me if she thought I had taken food from white people. Uh, school stuff, I said, setting the bags on the stairs. Didn't Albert tell you where I was? Of course he did. That's why I'm washing dishes in the dark. If those white people bringing you home decided to pull up to the house, this way they at least wouldn't be able to see in. Is that why no outside light on either? You've seen how they live now, the way their houses are different from ours. That boy's going to want to come here. Do you understand why he can't? He'd be coming to see me, not the house, I said, realizing I did want to have George over and play some of my records for him. I'd taken the plunge I was most afraid of, and I'd enjoyed it more than I could have ever imagined. He opened a door for me, and I wanted, I wanted to return that favor. If I wanted to keep this friend, I was going to have to meet the expectation of exchange in some way. But more than that, I wanted to have him here to show him my world, such as it was. Well, you can forget it, she said. I looked at the places where our walls were covered with plastic stapled to insulation, and at the newspapers under the water pail where we kept drinking water from a hand pump outside to say nothing of the slop bucket in the corner. I heard a dog nosing around in our closed off kitchen at the back where part of the roof had caved in one bad winter and I gritted my teeth. Those neighborhood dogs had figured out a way to poke their muzzles through a gap in the warped kitchen door frame and they wiggled inside. A few were always sneaking in. Some nights I ignored their rumblings in the kitchen but on evenings when my mom wasn't home and there was nothing on TV, I would hide behind the stove with a basket of my brother Zach's lacrosse balls. I'd seen those nose poke in, then the head of that dog would peek in, and though it could probably smell me, the scent of our stove must have been more compelling. I'd wait until the dogs were all the way in, then I'd jump out and whip the balls at their thick furred hides. They'd turn, howl, and squeeze back through the frame, but by then I'd usually gotten in a few good wallops. I didn't like chasing the dogs away, and under other circumstances, we were even friendly. I hoped they understood it was just a matter of territory, that I couldn't let go of the idea that I had a semi-normal house, however far-fetched it was. What was I thinking, that I could have George over to play whack-a-mutt with me? I grabbed my things and went upstairs, where my Uncle Albert was lying on his bed, flipping through a magazine listening to Deep Purple. Thank you. Uh, music plays a very large, large role in, um, in this novel. And since it's set in the 70s, it's kind of 60s and 70s music. The title itself comes from Paul McCartney and Wings' um, song, Band on the Run. It's kind of like the middle verse. And um, I guess in that way, my life is reflected here. This is essentially my primary um, mode of entertainment is to go to, to go to rock concerts. And I think most of my wardrobe when I'm not at work is concert t-shirts. And some of them I totally can't even fit anymore. I look like a sausage when I'm trying to wear them, you know. But I can't, I can't really give them up because it's my passion. It's nice that a lot of... Uh, Musicians now know that, that people who go to their shows are, um, are, are in decent financial straits because you know, to, to afford a ticket, you kind of need to know that. And so they've started marketing regular dress shirts as well. So this is like a Roger Waters shirt from the Wall Tour. Um, it's very, very subtle, but uh, so that's my way of still wearing a concert shirt here. Um, it's kind of weird that the time goes very fast at these things, and so I have a bunch of other Jeopardy questions here, um, which I can inflict upon you. Uh, but if you have others that you would actually like answered, um, I would be happy to answer them. They get increasingly weirder, by the way, as, as the list goes on.
Like, people are really shy about this, you know, and they're like, oh, I don't want to be that first person. Ah, thank you. Hi. Hi. Oh. Isn't that scary? It is. I'm a Canisius College grad, too. I oh. graduated in 2005. Wow. So, Hi. Yeah, <laughs> our past never crossed. Um, I have, I went to Canisius, but I never read your work. But I um, have read a lot of other um, novels by Native American authors and about um, Native Americans, specifically the children's experience. Um, my father is a teacher at Akron Central High School. Oh, OK. So Sure. Um, and I've always noticed a profound dichotomy between the world on the reservation and the world off of the reservation. And um, having not read any of your books, which I'm now going to do, of course. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you. Do you find that still exists as profoundly? Because um, most of the books I'm talking about, like Sherman Alexi and um, How Borland's When the Legends Die, um, there was just like substantial difference between you know what you could say the is the outside world and the world of the reservation and i don't know if this is still the case or you know because you're still writing about it too uh thank you thank you for being the first that's very exciting um <clears throat> yes <laughs> um I think the differences are, are not the same as they were back then i think uh, socioeconomic changes have occurred but even to the degree that um, that I'm aware of those things, I know that probably my view is kind of skewed. Um, so to me, it seems much more progressive than, than it did at the time I was growing up. I would say that most of the people I hung out with did not have running water, and now most of them do. So that's pretty exciting that, you know, we've moved up into the 20th century in the 21st century. Um, but I, I also have to say that, um, Another Indian writer was visiting me a few years ago, and one of the things she wanted to do was to come out and see the, the landmarks that she thought you know, were in the novels and you know, what their real life counterparts were. And, and she you know, had had many reservation experiences, had grown up partly on one. And as we drove around, she said, wow, this is like a time machine. This is like res circa 1970s everywhere else. So apparently it has not changed as much as it has in, in other parts of the country. Um, in some ways, I'm glad that of the changes that exist, hygiene is maybe a little bit more of a, you know, of a priority, so I'm, I'm stoked about that. Um, but in other ways, I'm also glad that, that it, it does kind of still exist in that same way, because it's like a battery for me. I just, I just need to drive around res roads in order to get ready to write. So, hi, thank you. Hi. Um, I was wondering how you would contrast um, writing books for adults as opposed to young adults, if your approach is any different, and how that plays out. Uh, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. Um, one of the th one of the things that happened with the origin of this book is is that most of my writing for adults uh, has at least fifty percent of it is about younger life. Um, it's it's adults reflecting on on their younger lives. I was joking about my last novel that not much ever happens in the present for my characters. It's sort of like they think about the last 30 years for like 50 pages, and then they go and make a hand sandwich on page 51, you know? And so, so most, of the, most of the work is really grounded in that, that era. And um, so I, I guess I have often tapping younger life in, in all of that work, so it's never that big of a leap. And when I uh, met my editor, it was, it was through a children's lit advocate, Debbie Reese, who some of you who are librarians probably know who she is. Um, she's a very explicit advocate for um, representation of American Indians in, in literature. She has a, a terrific blog. Um, she's a very thoughtful person. And she asked me one day quite explicitly. She said, you know, you write about young life all the time. Have you ever considered writing a young adult novel? And, um, and I didn't, I have to confess, I didn't really even know necessarily what the distinctions were at the time. Uh, and I had certainly read some of The Outsiders, still one of my favorite books. I mean, I, I confess I read it like once every two or three years even now. Um, I always want to be Pony Boy, but I just, you know, I'm probably more like Johnny in the hospital. Um, and so I had a great conversation with my editor at Scholastic, who, whom Debbie had introduced me to, uh, about what the differences were between young adult and, and adult fiction. 
And one of the things she said was that, well, there's, there's tremendous agency and immediacy. And what that meant in very real ways was that the characters are kind of living their lives at the moment. They're not looking at them years later. You know, they're, they're just kind of there. And, um, and also that, that they get to act. You know, that they're, that they're not being acted upon. And I, and I really understood that because when you're a young person, you get acted upon all the time. You almost never have any agency in your life. You don't even get to decide what time you're going to bed, you know. Parents are like, all right, it's 10.30, get up there. And you're like, no, no, five more minutes, you know. I think so we're still negotiating those things as, as young people. And I noticed that... Um, when I started reading young adult novels in order to kind of get ready to write this, that there were a lot of dead parents, um, and the outsiders included as a lot of dead parents. I mean, they get hit by a train in the outsiders, so I don't think you can get much more dead than that. Um, and and I, I understood that passionately, and I remember desiring that freedom, but I also knew that at home, um, intergeneral relationships. I mean, we, we really hang out together a lot. Adults hang out together with, with children and teens are in the middle of all of it. And I knew that I had to represent that. So when I was working on this novel, the adult characters I, were going to play a larger part than I had seen in many other young adult novels. So in some ways, this was probably like a hybrid. Um, I asked friends of mine who, who um, are what writers call their trusted readers, the people who uh, I think, like Hemingway impolitely called them the shit detectors. You know, they're the, they're the people who tell you when your work isn't working. And, uh, and I asked them to read it, read the first draft, and then ultimately the draft that was going to go forward for publication. And I knew they were very different kinds of books. And I, I said, so does this still seem like a book by me? And they said, oh yeah, it's just you with way too much coffee. Um, so it's a speedier story than I usually tell. Um, and I also loved the freedom of, of being able to tell the story just of these, these two young guys. Usu uh, I should say that about 10 years ago I was trying to write a version of this book, but um, from an adult point of view in which it was these two middle-aged uh, guys who were, who were meeting one another again 30 years later. And I could never really get it to sing. It just didn't do what I wanted it to. And I realized it was because I really had no interest in who they were as middle-aged people. You know, it was just the excuse to uh, to open up the story into their past and see what what that first real best friendship is like. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. I was curious how you. S I, I went right to the discography. How did you settle on that period of music and those particular albums? Um, it was kind of a funny thing. I, I have a very weird relationship with all of my work uh, as I'm working on multiple projects at once. Sometimes it's poetry, sometimes it's drama, um, novels. Uh, lately I've been saying that I have kind of a Stockholm Syndrome relationship with my work, so it's whichever thing hijacks me and takes me prisoner is the one that, that I uh, pay most attention to. Because uh, you, need, you need the fire when you're working. And often, because of that, other work informs um, what I, what I, you know, other work I've been working on starts informing these things. And I was working on a, a poetry project about, about the Beatles um, called The Apple Years. It's not, it's not out yet, I'm not sure it's even finished. But uh, there's a reservation slang uh, the apple, that's like a critical thing that people say to each other. It's red on the outside, white on the inside. So since I work, you know, kind of still very much within my community and in the outside world, I'm sure there are people who, who call me this very thing. So I'm just kind of taking it back. So actually, here's my little Beatles apple right here. Um, and so, you know, if, if that's who you think I need to be, then for you to, to live your life, that's OK, that's your thing. And so while I started working on this, um, originally, they were going to go to a, a Queen concert, so it's really all my musical taste, ultimately, is what's dumped in there. And, um, but somewhere in the middle, I think I had just gotten Paul McCartney tickets to Toronto, and, uh, and I remember even, I, I got very excited about that. They were great tickets, finally. I think the last time I'd seen him, I was up in the, like, six miles up section, so I was kind of near the stage, finally. 
Um, and kind of getting ready for that show, I, I looked up his past, you know, the, it's great, again, Google, I found tour histories. And the Wings Over America tour hit Toronto right when I needed it to for this book. So it kind of uh, took that direction unexpectedly at first. And when I knew that was a dominant force, it started reshaping things. But I also remember emailing my editor and saying, hey, I got great Paul McCartney tickets. And she, of course, had no idea what I was talking about, that it had nothing to do with the book at that point. And her email back was, um, OK, glad. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, it worked out, and so it, I, I trust, that's the magic of writing for me, is to not really know where it's going and to trust the darkness. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I, I first wanted to thank you. I actually um, also grew up in western New York, and I feel like I'm on the other side. I have friends who lived on the Tuscarora Nation, and so it's very interesting for me to kind of, I'm excited to read your book so I can hear about the other side. Oh. Um, but my <laughs> question is, um, with, with your... Um, Haudenosaunee roots is if you wanted to read a comprehensive history of the nation, where would you go? Uh, wow. Um, there's, there's a book that was just published recently. Um, and this, this seems like a weirdly self-serving thing and I'm, I want to backtrack and say it's totally not. Uh, but it's a book called The Tuscaroras. It's uh, by this 90-something year old anthropologist who has spent many different periods um, hanging out with people from the reservation. And I, I want to say SUNY Press put it out. Um, but, but I wind up in there as a character, which is kind of startling as a, you know, becoming an anthropological figure. And, and he does an interpretation of my second novel that's like way wrong. <laughs> um, so maybe other parts of it are excellent and accurate, but it's, it's a novel about the, the kind of dynamics of smoke shop millionaires, the, the tension of, uh, progressives and traditionalists within reservation communities and the kind of economic impact of that, um, of that exchange. But I thought it was weirdly reflective of who he, this guy was as a writer because he was insisting that one character was the hero of this book and, and it's like the biggest jerk in the book. And I thought the person with the most money is not the hero of the book always. So in that way, I, I'm not sure to what degree it's an accurate book, but I, I also thought it had a lot of great things that were accurate. So that would be, that'd be my recommendation with a little grain of salt. And cut out those two pages where, yeah. <laughs> Looks like we have time for maybe one more question. All right, I guess I'm going to go for the weird Jeopardy question. I think we might have covered most of these. Oh, okay. What's the deal with the Beatles anyway? Isn't the British invasion kind of ironic for a reservation novel? Um, it would be, except that, that is our world. We, uh, we are constantly moving back and forth between two worlds, like sometimes at a moment's notice, and we've learned to be the, these, uh, I guess, cultural amphibians maybe is way, the way you'd think of it. And, uh, you know, rock and roll still lives there as, as it does anywhere else. I have, you know, I have cousins and so forth who are traditional dancers or, um, or social singers, but largely when it comes down to it, we're mostly rock people. Um, I think my, my nephew's kids now are kind of like Jay-Z and Rihanna, but uh, so, you know, they're, they're evolving with the times in ways that I am less so. Um, I try to, try to do my job, you know, bring the Decemberists and Death Cat for Cutie to them, but they're not hip to it. Um, <laughs> all right, well, I guess that's where we are. Thank you so much for uh, coming. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.